thank you very much, Roland, for being here. Thank you very much to all the audience for also attending this, this talk. Roland is, is with us today to talk about airborne wind energy, how to generate uh, electric power with kites, quite an exciting and multidisciplinary topic. He's going to provide us some, some um, fundamentals, theoretical, and also talk about experiments, companies, and what's going on today in the world with this technology. Um, uh, Roland uh, graduated in mechanical engineering in 1994, received a PhD degree in from Karlsruhe University. He, he then did a postdoc and, and joined the industry as a propulsion engineer, working at ESA, also a company in the automobile industry. And then in 2009, he joined the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering at UDAP as a field professor. And he has been leading the, a pioneering group on kite power research, where he is focusing on the multidisciplinary challenges of urban wind energy. From 2015 to 2018, coordinated the Marie Curie Doctoral Training Network, called AWESCO. And from 2015 to 2019, the Fast Track to Innovation Project, called REACH, both uh, founded by the European Union's uh, Framework Program, where applies on this. Horizon Econ, sorry, that is uh, finishing this year. In 2006, he did with uh, Johannes Special, the university spin off company Kite Power BB, that develops a 100 kilowatt kite power system. He has co edited and edited two Springer books about the emerging technology uh, of uh, energy, and since 2015, co organizes the International Urban Wind Energy Conference. He is a member of the core team that established the International Energy Agency's Green Plus 48 on Urban Wind Energy, a launch uh, that was, was launched in October 2021. And he is author of 82 peer reviewed scientific publications. Uh, so, thanks very much uh, again, Roland, for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Please, when you're ready, just uh, start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel, um, for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here. Um, please interrupt me if if um, if there is a problem with the audio or with the slides, because I, 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 I can't see anyone here. So I will speak about generally about airborne wind energy, the power generation with kites. And what you see here is our um, the experimental platform that we developed at TU Delft from 2010 onwards. This is an aerial shot from a helicopter uh, from the year 2012, so relatively early in the development of this technology. Um, maybe this is just, um, I think this is kind of useless here in that frame. Um, you nicely introduced myself already, so I can actually skip this slide. Thing. These are the two Springer books that I co-edited together, more than a thousand pages of contributed material. So this is really a nice compendium. We are currently um, um, editing um, a special issue on airborne wind energy uh, with the journal Energies. So also that one we expect to become something like a third addition to this uh, compendia, um, only this time now in open access. Okay, outline for today. I will first look at the fundamental working principles of airborne wind energy. Um, then I will introduce a basic theory of tethered flight. Um, then look at implemented airborne wind energy concepts, and pumping kite concepts, um, then I'll go more into detail um, uh, with the uh, research at TU Delft and finally look at some international activities. Okay, let's first look at the fundamental working principles. So we start from the horizontal axis wind turbine. Uh, you see here on the right, so we have the tower, the nacelle, which also houses the generator. And um, the generator is driven by the rotor. Uh, which in most cases nowadays consists of three rotor blades. We do know um, that the outermost um, um, part of the tip 
it's actually moving fastest. Um, this is also the part that creates the largest torque contribution to the generator. And the idea of airborne wind energy is now something like that. How could we further radically optimize such a turbine? Um, and we can do that by actually removing um, the inner part of the blades and removing the tower altogether. Then the necessity is to go to a tensile structure, and that's a that's the actually that's the structural definition of an airborne wind energy system. The generator itself can either be flying with the devices or be placed on the ground. We'll look first at the first type, the so-called fly gen systems. Um, they are more closer to a wind turbine than the other type we'll look at later. So as I said, the, the, we take the outermost part of the, of the wind turbine blade and, uh, and fly it through the air. In this way, it has an um, almost uniform high speed. Uh, it's not, uh, the speed is not decreasing because we get closer to the hub. So that's one thing. The other thing is we move the generator uh, onto this uh, device. So basically we use the blade to move fast through the air and we have small onboard wind turbines to convert that energy, the, the, the incoming flow into electricity and this is then conducted down the tether. So tether is already one important element of an airborne wind energy system. Um, so the side effect of this uh, radical optimization is that we can also access wind at higher altitudes because with the tether we have a lot more freedom where and how we operate this device. Um, the second type of system is the so-called ground gen system. Um, here we place the generator on the ground and we use the airborne device, in this case here, a soft wing, to fly these figure of eight maneuvers and, and, and generating a high tractive force and pulling the tether off the drum. So the pulling force or the tractive force and the motion, the real out motion of the tether drives the generator producing angular electricity. It's clear at one point we will hit the maximum tether length. Then we need to stage um, a real in phase. In the real in phase, we stop the figure of eight maneuvers. Uh, we reduce dramatically the force, also possibly by uh, actuating the kite into a lower angle of attack configuration. We do reel in, and now we need a part of that energy. Um, we, to, we consume that part of energy to reel in the, the kite using the generator as a motor. What I didn't display here is a battery or a network connection. So we need to somehow buffer the energy um, over this so-called pumping cycle. No? So these are the two concepts. And uh, in this plot, um, so of these two concepts, there are multiple different implementations. I will introduce them later, um, but these are the two basic forms. Um, this this, this uh, diagram nicely illustrates, let's say, the, the, this radical optimization idea. We go from a wind turbine to an airborne wind energy system. So basically we take this part of the blade and make it into a free flying or a tethered flying vehicle. And these two systems, the turbine on the left, the airborne wind energy system on the right, have similar power output. And you see with much less structural mass. This is the TwinTech pilot system from 2019. On the right hand side, you see a, a, a visionary extrapolation of that concept to the megawatt scale. Here you see the um, Ampix power plant, uh, two megawatt system next to a two megawatt wind turbine. Um, so how, how are these airborne wind energy systems going to be used? Um, we can have them onshore, um, here, let's say onshore or offshore. Um, the idea is 
we can have much simpler offshore foundations, also onshore foundations actually, because we do not need to carry the bending moment of the turbine rotor, um, because we have a, a force a connection point directly at the, at the platform itself. Um, so with two megawatt of these systems, we can power approximately 2000 households. And uh, a very interesting ideas to actually use them in a microgrid also, or for hybrid electricity systems, combining them with conventional wind and solar to complement, let's say, to use the different availabilities of these resources um, to have a complementary um, energy provision and, and rather generate a, a more uniform output profile. And here on the right hand side, you just see these two features of the wind turbine with a general hub height at 100 meter, while the airborne wind energy system can go to 500 meter. So these are just a few pictograms. And I summarized this here on this, this, um, this slide. Uh, posit, let's say advantages here on the left top, uh, challenges on the right bottom. So on the one hand, we consume less material. We are highly adjustable to the wind resource. So we can generally achieve a higher capacity factor. And we have access to high altitude wind and very important, an increased mobility. So such an airborne wind energy system, you can rapidly um, pack and deploy somewhere, which, and you can imagine there are a few or some applications where this is particularly important. On the challenge side, and this is where we mostly work on right now, it's more complex than a wind turbine. So we have a flying system that makes it also very demanding uh, in terms of reliability and uh, also to have robust control. We depend on high performance material. So everything that's flying is essentially plastic material. There, let's say in Delft, we have also this, uh, this airborne flying robot, the kite control unit, also sky sails, which is depicted here has that. Uh, that's a small solid part, but in principle, everything that's flying is plastic, uh, high performance plastic. And of course, you can imagine we penetrate into the airspace of aviation. So we, we do need to revise the current regulatory framework. And that is something that normally takes a long time. We see now that it's not so easy to do that. Um, okay. Maybe let's uh, look at some practically implemented concepts. And here is just a, a quick overview of what's out there. Uh, we, we see here on the, I think it's a little bit outdated already. We see here soft wing systems, kite power sky sails. They are still flying. KPS was absorbed by kite mill uh, last year, actually. Then we have Enerkite. Enerkite is a so-called hybrid system. It has a rigid, sorry, it has a, a fixed wing structural subframe, but the, the, the wing is made with a flexible membrane um, canopy. So this is what we call hybrid. And then we have the so-called uh, fixed wing systems uh, or drones. And they, they, they can have, um, let's say, th this, this type here of Ampex power has, is, is designed for horizontal takeoff and landing. So these are air, um, um, launch assist propellers for kite mill, twin tech, um, e-wind solutions. We have vertical takeoff and landing um, devices, VTOL. So these actually launch vertically. And then we have also this uh, wind swept system, which is a completely different type. It's actually, um, it's a turbine that uses a, rot um, a rotational tether frame to transport the torque to the ground. It also uses a lifting kite to keep that whole arrangement under a certain angle of attack. Um, how can we classify these systems? And um, I think most common nowadays is to first look at the 
a place where we generate the energy um, and then in a second stage uh, look at the way the systems are operated so electricity generation can be either uh, with a fixed ground station on ground with a moving ground station or on board of the flying device so this was the first concept that we looked at on the flying device electricity generation in crosswind and that's the makani um, and kite craft type of systems then with the fixed ground station in crosswind mode we have a whole group of systems so that's i would say the majority of current implementations we saw them on the previous slide also a lot of VTOL fixed wing systems then also HTOL uh, systems um, we saw ampix ampix uses a catapult for launching and landing enerkite a rotational start uh, launching and landing so both HTOL as opposed to VTOL um, and then we have also multi-drone concepts where we have several kites and we have the group of the soft wing systems, for example, kite power or sky sails. And here, uh, fixed wing ground station rotational, we have the uh, windswept concept and some AWE. Okay, so that's the whole classification chart. We will look um, in this lecture only at the uh, fixed ground station crosswind type of system and a bit also at the um, uh, fly gen systems that are operated in crosswind mode and and for, for for if some of you are interested to read a bit further into this i also have a nice uh, explainer uh, article here from 2019 on this web page of westco.eu awe minus explained and uh, this is a longer blog post in which I go through all the different systems and the basic theory that was in the frame of the doctoral training network. Uh, so we'll now look at these uh, four technology demonstrators a bit more closer. Um, so we have the Makani system. Makani um, was a company that, uh, that one of the pioneers in airborne wind uh, set up in 2006, so quite early, um, around 2010-11, they they um, they stopped with the soft wing experimentation and they went ahead with a rigid wing concept uh, that you see here uh, vert for vertical takeoff and landing. Um, that small scale system was called Wing Seven. In 2019, Makani tested this 600 kilowatt uh, electric kite. Um, that's uh, with the 600 kilowatt, the, probably the biggest uh, drone that was ever flown, or at least the most powerful one. Uh, you see here the test in Norway uh, under offshore conditions from this spar buoy, which they also custom made. And where they hooked up the the launch pad so that was actually a very impressive demonstration unfortunately in 2020 google decided google the mother company decided to stop this project and focus more on their core business and that fate was shared with other uh, google x projects uh, i think also project loon was stopped and several other ones um, but they do have a small brother um, and that's Kitecraft from Munich, a spin-off of the TU Munich. Um, they basically pick up this technology pool um, and implement, it, implement here an, a box wing system. Uh, what you don't see here are the rotors. They are currently already testing. This is a bit an older shot from wind tunnel tests. So I think um, we, we are all looking quite interesting in that interested in that direction to see how Kitecraft is developing. Of course, with the advantage to have a big pool of IP from Makani, because Makani pledged um, when they release pledged or they release their IP with a non-assertion pledge. That means. Um, the IP is freely available for everyone interested. And they pledge that they will not 
um, ask for licensing fees. So that's actually quite a noble gesture to the community. Then we have uh, Amplix Power. You see here the 50 kilowatt AP2. I'm not sure if that is correct. 50 kilowatt, I think it's a bit less. Um, it's a rigid wing system, seven meter wingspan. Um, here they fly in the North Ost Polder. Um, here you see this AP3. It's a um, double fuselage. This is a, an aircraft. This is a model that was built here in 2018 to test it on a small scale uh, launch platform, floating launch platform. So this was a, 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 a nationally uh, funded project within the TKI wind. Here you see the the full scale AP3 in production in The Hague. Um, here the, um, the, the, the molds that were used for the wing, as far as I know, with the, with the device here in the back. And then we switch, uh, and currently, what I forgot to say, and unfortunately I don't have a photo here, the Ampix is now testing in Holland. Uh, they were testing and flying in May on Breda International Airport without the tether. The idea is now, I think, Spain to do uh, uh, flight testing and also Ireland to then fly on the test site of RWE. Then TwinTech is a Swiss uh, spin off of EMPA, the, the, um, um, the national lab. And they have this uh, very nicely manufactured VTOL system. So you see it here on a on a test stand, test platform. Um, this is the system that you saw in comparison with the wind turbine. And then we come to Delft. In Delft, we, we were also quite early active. Um, before my time, I started in 2009, there was already a system in place. This ground station did exist already. And with ground station, I mean this blue uh, um, box here, which is uh, housing the generator and the battery system that did exist already in 2011, uh, 10 and 11, we, we uh, designed and built this kite control unit, which is a, which is a suspended uh, remote controlled cable robot that steers this wing. And this is the V2. What you also see here, a small detail, um, is a pitot tube, which we use to measure um, the apparent wind velocity. And maybe that's that's one key difference of the TUDEL system uh, with other systems. We use it mainly to, to um, for research, uh, to har harvest data, to, to, to measure whatever necessary to also develop physical models so you will always see our system with a lot of sensors in place so here you see this pumping cycle uh, visualized on the right hand side this is the kite uh, tether ground station also here and we first fly these figure of eight maneuvers that i had already in the first part of the lecture and then we stop at some point the figure eight motion we have a short transition phase where we don't change the tether length so the kite can actually recover to a higher angle of um, higher angle of elevation and then we start reeling in up to a point where we reach the minimum tether length and then we do this dive maneuver to continue the figure eight motions and what you see here is a so-called pumping cycle pumping because we pull the tether off the ground station and we um, uh, pull it then back into the ground station. Uh, it's the so-called yo-yo movement. And that's also a name that you hear often. Um, what's This is a simulation of uh, Uwe Fechner, who did his PhD with me. And so this is not measured data, but measured data looks by now exactly the same. Uh, it is a nice data set to see the, the altitude range. So you see we fly between 150 and 400 meter. And the 400 meter ceiling is mainly because of the 
flight permit that we have for this test site here in Falkenberg airfield. Um, it had an, has an ATZ air traffic, aerodrome traffic zone um, with a ceiling height of 450 meters. And these are the system components of our, of our experimental platform. Um, I think I should not go into all the details here. Uh, a lot of this is already known and presented many, many times. Maybe the key thing is that it's all remote controlled. So the, 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 let's say the brain sits here in this ground station, the control center. Uh, it has a wireless connection to the KCU, the kite control unit, and also to a wind meter to measure the ground wind speed. And of course, with this KCU, a lot of data is collected. For example, here the wind, the, the relative wind velocity, but also IMU and um, and GPS sensors that are distributed here over the wing. Um, by now, we can use them also to measure the deformation of the wing, which is very important for these flexible wing systems um, because it has an effect on the steering behavior. Um, maybe the other thing that's interesting to see here is this launch mast. In 2013, we developed also a launch mast uh, that allowed us to launch and land the kite from an upside down hanging position. Um, I will show a video of that here because it's a quite interesting concept that we have parked for now, but at some point we, we, we want to pick that up again because it's a very compact um, setup that allows for dynamic launch maneuvers where, you, where the flying kite also produces some um, pulling force um, this is, um, let's say, this is the zoo of our kites. You see uh, the, this uh, TU Delta V3 kite. Uh, this is not true. This is actually the V2 kite here, the left column. Uh, you can recognize that from this black trailing edge, and it's more curved. Then we have the Genetrix Hydra, Genetrix Hydra 14 square meter kite. This is still a commercial kite. Um, a surf kite, and but uh, we in 2013 we built this um, uh, der derivative, uh, we scaled it up to 25 square meter. It uses the same base design, but it's a more powerful kite. And this kite, I believe, even Kite Bauer, our spin off, has flown that until a year or two ago um, because it's a, it's a very nice platform for testing. And what's specific about that kite is this wavy leading edge design feature. And you see that here in frontal and side views, you clearly see that the Hydra and the V3 are, um, let's say, are related or scaled versions where the V3 has this extra uh, wavy um, leading edge. Um, maybe what's interesting for the kite uh, experts among you, uh, what's interesting to see here is that the front bridle line system, which is uh, displayed in black, is supporting uh, the leading edge at many places. And of course, that has to be because the leading edge is, um, let's say, most of the load on the kite goes through the leading edge to the tether. While the red lines are the, um, the steering lines, the rear bridle line system, and you see for the V2 here on the left, so this is a mistake, when it says V3, um, for the V2, it's only the tip that is supported, but the rest remainder of the trailing edge of the wing is free. Um, that's completely different for the Hydra and the V3, where the trailing edge is entirely supported. So every strut has a front and a rear bridle line attached. This entire bridling um, allows us to make the wing flatter and have a more higher performing wing. Um, maybe another interesting thing here is this cross bar or cross uh, bridle line, which we use as an additional stability feature to 
not have these inside out flappings of the wing when under extreme condition of negative angle of attack. We continue, this is a quick view into the kite control unit, uh, very early stage. So two the small motors, uh, battery packs here. I think these are angular sensors, um, wireless controller. Um, so this is re this was really for for six years, seven years our workhorse. Um, it's watertight. It was actually developed with uh, with the regional grant um, EU funding, but regional for a Dutch province, Friesland. Um, by now, uh, our spin-off has brought this concept a lot further. The kite control unit got more powerful. It also has an onboard uh, ram air wind turbine to replace these batteries or the major part of these batteries to, to be completely um, autarky. That's the ground station. Um, this is like uh, the, the, the tractor. It's really heavy duty engineering. Um, it has a big drum. That's still the old ground station of, of Tudel. A big drum, the generator, then here um, a, um, a gear box to connect the two. And what you also see here, these two, this linear um, array, and let's say this, um, these linear tracks that allow this whole module here to slide left and right, driven by the spindle drive motor. Um, this swivel head is fixed, so the tether is coming in, going through pulleys onto the drum. And by moving this whole sled, um, this whole module left and right, you get it very nicely winding on and off the drum, which is important. Um, let me check the time. Um, then I want to speak a bit more about this pumping cycle. Um, this is also data from our TUDEL platform. Um, the pumping cycle is the real out and the real in phase. During real out, uh, and this I believe is test data, during real out you basically produce here about 25 kilowatts of power. Then we switch to real in. Um, and then we consume about something around 10 kilowatts, but at a shorter interval. And the difference of the blue and the red area is the net power, in this case, 12 kilowatt average power. Of course, we do need a battery to store this. Um, so we have these alternating real out and real in phases. Um, maybe you will might ask me why is it so zaggy here this line this is this, let's say this waviness here has a number of reasons the first reason is we fly figure of eight maneuvers and the highest power is generated when we fly um, at a minimum angle to the when the tether is the angle between tether and wind speed wind velocity vector is minimal of course, you can imagine when you fly these figure of eight maneuvers, this angle is constantly changing. So the traction power is constantly changing. The traction force is constantly changing and also the power. So this is like a flight maneuver induced variation. Um, and that should have the frequency of the figure eight maneuvers. But then there is also the, the then there are also wind fluctuations, of course, turbulence or wind gusts and they will lead to an additional noisiness of this signal. Um, okay, so this is the pow instantaneous power profile at six meter per second ground wind speed. When we do this operation at different ground wind speeds, we can create something like a power curve. A power curve is the machine characteristics of the system. And you see now here on the right hand side, the power curve of this system, uh, where the red dot is the value that comes from, from this diagram. So the 12 uh, kilowatt, uh, watch out, the, the um, axes are, late, um, are not to scale. You see when we go to smaller, wind, lower wind speeds, the average power drops. Um, 
and the, two, the, the let's say the six meter per second seems to be the highest um, power that the system can generate because when we fly at higher wind speed, the power drops again, the average power. So this regime here is uh, the, the cubic relation. This is simply because the wind speed gets higher. We can produce more wind up to the point here where we hit the maximum. From that point on, we need to change the control strategy of the system um, because we reach the um, the maximum tether tension in the system. So we do need to depower more um, during real in, and we need to consume, let's say, we, we have also reached the maximum deep degree of depower. So actually when we have to reel in with increasing wind speed, the system needs more power. So that's the reason for this maximum here. And this is just a, lot of automatic pumping cycles. This was in 2012. So this was for us like a, a big milestone that we reached in, in the harbor of Rotterdam. And I think this, this picture, this photo is also a bit iconic because you see here, um, it's small detail, you see here the 500, um, 500 megawatt uh, EON power plant fossil fuels you see um, the neon, neon wind turbines here on the dike. Uh, of course, compared to the power plant, they have a small rating. And then you see our 12 kilowatt kite here flying in the sky. Uh, so yeah, we have all generations of power generation here uh, with the very dirty variant being the fossil fuel power plant. I said I wanted to speak about the launching and landing of our system here, you see the kite suspend, that's the V3 suspended from the mast. And this is the, how the kite uh, then launches. You see the tether goes through this, um, through this mast head rail here, where it's also fixed with a small pulley up to the point when the kite is in an upright down position. And I think I have a video here, so I go to the next slide. Ah, no, okay, this is just a summary. Um, anyway, this is a detail I can easily skip that. So I hope that you can all see that. So this is a time synchronized video from ground and kite. So you see how the kite detaches from the masthead and then rises up. And the beauty of this launch maneuver, in my opinion, is that we can do it dynamically. So the kite is flying. Um, and a flying kite always produces a higher tether force than a static kite. But I have to also admit that it's a very um, challenging flight maneuver because uh, it's very much dependent on the wind conditions. So, just like what you saw here alone, maybe I show this once more. This was a lucky launch within many trials because we didn't have any um, ground system to, to, let's say, catapult the kite in a specific direction. So that would be the next thing to add to this kind of setup. Okay, and now fast forward, uh, we go to 2017, that's Kite Power. Uh, commercial spin-off. Uh, Kitebauer operated uh, as part of a, a larger EU project that we acquired. And you see here the 40 um, square meter kite. It's actually quite a beautiful one. Also a derivative of the V3. You see the first ground station that Kitebauer built. Um, so with uh, Let's say it was subcontracted to Dromek. Dromek um, is, a, is a partner of Kitebauer, uh, actually manufactures also ground stations for Ampix Power. You see in this setup, uh, we didn't use, or they did not use a container. Um, 
Also, the concept from ground station one of kite bow was changed a bit. Instead of moving the entire drum, it was now a sled where this swivel head was integrated and moving left and right. So moving less mass. And I think by now the, the, the ground station is entirely encapsulated in a container. They are now at ground, sta ground station three. Um, the nice thing is about this, this 100 kilowatt solution, it can still be transported easily to some place and then deployed. What you see here is a, a test on a military training field in the north of Holland. Um, so let's just see. Ah, yeah, this is what I want to show. So this is um, a photo from the ground station during the day with this V3 kite, actually a commercial derivative of our university kite. And that's a long time exposure during night. And this is very impressive, in my opinion, because it shows how accurate the control mechanism already is. So you see the figure of eight maneuvers and then the reel in phase and then this dive back into the figure of eight maneuvers. So this is all fully automatic. Um, um, there is no human intervention necessary. When the wind direction changes, um, the ground station is automatically readjusts and also the flight pattern is continuously uh, or in steps adjusted to changing wind conditions. I mentioned the airborne wind turbine. So this is um, not so spectacular. And um, of course, maybe this is one photo that already indicates that one system is not enough. So uh, they are in a series production, which is, uh, which is necessary because you need many parts to operate all these uh, prototypes out there, um, you need spare parts and so on. I think a step further is already the competitor SkySales that has a series production in place. Um, their 100 kilowatt system you can already order and purchase. Now here you see uh, 25 square meter, uh, 40 and 60 square meter wings set up one after the other. Uh, with the old ground station, I think here, uh, KCU here in the front. So this is also a nice photo from 2019. Um, this is the biggest wing that Kite Power built, a 100 square meter wing. And let's say with these photos show one thing that is particular about soft wings. You can easily build them. They are not expensive. You can, um, you can crash them. Um, um, also, the kite control units are, uh, are very well protected um, with padding and with other safety mechanisms. So when, when, when such a kite crashes during testing, you can usually relaunch it or even fix it easily and relaunch it. And that makes them a bit different to the fixed wing systems that are much more um, carefully to handle, not only because they are more risky, for ground, um, um, for, for things and people on the ground, but also um, because to themselves, then when you crash, they are broken and you, are you typically have to get a new system. That's what I want. That's the point I want to make. And maybe the consequences that the current companies that are uh, stepping into the market, um, that's uh, SkySales and uh, Kite Power. They both are based on soft wing systems. Um, that's only one photo of this ground station three of Kite Power with the, from the recent test in the Caribbean. So Kite Power was deployed, deployed their system there uh, and they flew for two weeks, if I'm not mistaken. So very nice record. Um, this I think I can skip because it's not so interesting for now. I wanted to say a few words about the uh, basic the theory. Actually, I should read basic theory. Um, so we saw a lot of practically relevant things now, but how can we describe that? Um, 
We have uh, Miles Lloyd in 1980. He, he actually published this paper, Crosswind Kite Bauer. And in this paper, he described these two mental cases, um, this flight gen that he called drag power and the ground gen that he called lift power. And both have distinctive advantages and disadvantages. I don't want to go into detail here. We focus in our theory, theory mainly on this lift power or ground gen concept. And, um, but let's say to compare um, what Lloyd did in his analysis, he compared a regular kite that is not flying maneuvers, where, but which is reeling out and reeling in to a crosswind kite, and he compared the so-called power harvesting factor. Power harvesting factor is a non-dimensional power value. Um, and when we plot his results for different lift to drag ratios, we see one thing, you can get a lot more power out of a crosswind system, while the um, non-crosswind system has a natural limit, um, which is here, actually vanishing in this diagram if you would scale them to the same scale which i didn't do here so this <clears throat> this real the left diagram is important because we need it also for the real end phase because we fly without um maneuvers um wh wh while the right the diagram is actually describing the behavior in the real out phase when you fly figure of eights um, what is important is that, the, let's say here we have this value of one third of the optimal real out factor, which is also something that Lloyd found, um, while um, for the regular kite this is, a, this is a changing value depending on which lift to drag ratio you have. I think this is a very nice plot that I will later transform into the 3D flight regime. Um, and maybe this, the, the details of this theory we skip, but I also don't have it very much detailed here. From Lloyd, you can develop a 3D theory by using spherical coordinates. So the azimuth angle and elevation angle, looking at the wind velocity and the kite velocity, you can then uh, formulate the apparent wind velocity. I have that here. So that's this VA in spherical coordinates uh, it's a bit complex let's say it's a graphically complex theory but in fact you get to very simple formulas this is the massless kite of course i should say with a non-zagging tether um, you can apply this similarity of um, of kinematic triangle and force triangle from the similarity, you can derive a closed set of equations. That is this one for the apparent wind velocity as a function of position, reeling factor, and aerodynamic performance. And having that uh, VA, non-dimensional here, you can develop formulas for the tractive force and the tractive power. So this is what we call the quasi-steady model of tethered flight, and we have used this in many ways to predict the performance of such a system. And here is one example plot for a zero azimuth um, angle and the lift to drag ratio of five, uh, CL is one. Then you can actually compute such um, ISO lines, let, let me Explain on the x-axis, we have the reeling factor F, on the y-axis, the elevation angle. The solid black line is the power harvesting factor, so the non-dimensional power. Um, and the red lines are what we call the um, tangential velocity factor. That's the ratio of the tangential, tangential to the tether, kite velocity to the wind velocity. When this gets to zero, which is this line, means the kite stops maneuvering. So in the power ISO lines, you can identify the optimal reeling factor, which is one third here on the x-axis, because this is the Lloyd ideal 
crosswind type, and then this value decreases. Um, you can also find out that we have an unphysical regime here above the lambda equals zero and beta max um, lines. So this regime that you saw here with isolines, you can actually not fly. And I want to show what is specific about this. On this axis, on the x-axis, you have or you have this diagram and on the beta max isoline you actually have this diagram so remember this diagram is along this line here so you see that the um, power harvesting factor goes into a maximum somewhere here and then it decreases again so so Lloyd's theory nicely envelops here and here the full performance diagram of a kite. And I, I find this really interesting. And once we introduce mass, and I will not show this, this whole regime here actually shrinks into a smaller sector. So it will shrink from F equal one to a small sector here on the right. Okay, I'm not sure. Yes, maybe this is one plot uh, that I will only show um, because actually it doesn't belong to the theory, but that was as much theory as I wanted to say, wanted to convey here. Maybe this is simply the R&D landscape that we had in 2018. Quite a lot of companies and um, universities here in Europe being active. Uh, some of the names have changed, some disappeared, and some uh, are new by now. Uh, we have also some activity in the US, but Makami perished, of course. Uh, we do have Japan and also China in, involved now. What I wanted to show you, and so this slide was, I think, misplaced here. What I wanted to show you is the research at Tier Delft and in terms of time, I can, as you see, it's already two. I can only run through this, so we will make this a quick go through, and then we, we're at the end. Um, in Delft, we look at reliability and safety, or this, let's put it this way, these are the practical challenges of airborne wind. Reliability and safety, durability of materials, and regulations. Then on the research side, in Delft, we look at the aerodynamics and um, structural dynamics of kites. Here you see, for example, the result of a vortex lattice method that we used for this software. You see here nicely the wake panels detaching from the wing. We are also doing CFD analysis, um, fluid structure interaction. So in what you see here is a measured wing surface um, we measured it with photogrammetry, and uh, on top of that is CFD simulation of the flow field. So this, this plot is already like, I think, 13 years old. It was done in 2008 before I even started, but I still like it. It's a very nice visualization. It's a so-called RAM air wing, and you see also the, the uh, surface feature result. Um, then we also look at the development of the flow field here in two, in terms of two um, two dimensional simulations. That's a, this typical leading edge inflatable uh, airfoil where you have this inflated tube here and then the canopy and you always have a, a larger uh, recirculation zone here on the pressure side of the wing. And this is, let's say, very challenging for inviscid methods it's, uh, you really need to do something special there to be able to solve it. This is the domain where CFD excels, but of course it's also costly. Uh, here you see an, an, a, a, a finite volume mesh, just an example of, a, of an open foam simulation that we did with the kite. And, and here you see the flow field from this CFD simulation. That's actually the V3 kite. You nicely see here separation of the flow at high angle of attack. 
Um, this is a streamlined plot and where you nicely see the, um, you don't see the, um, the wingtip vortices, you see the vorticity that de detaches at the training edge. Um, yeah, the, the turbulent features. Oops. Um, maybe this is one very specific field in Delft. I think also in, in at uh, UC3M, this is a focal point, kite dynamics, kite aerodynamics. Um, we studied this here in a NASA thesis with a specific setup with two flow veins to get the proper um, apparent wind velocity. Actually, this is one setup that we designed while this is the older pitot tube. We, we used both of these setups. And uh, um, one thing that we found is when you go from powered, so low, ang uh, high angle of attack to depowered state where you reel out the, uh, where you pay out the trailing edge, the steering lines, um, that the center of pressure changes, it goes from quarter court that we know for the powered state way back on the wing. Uh, so really the aerodynamics affect also how this kite as a whole um, orients itself. Um, and we track this also with uh, onboard video cameras, with photogrammetry. And this is, let's say, where it all comes together, a CFD plot. So this was the CFD simulation, the recent one, with measured experimental data for uh, the lift coefficient. We also have that for the drag coefficient. And one mystery that we try to solve is uh, this, why, is, why do we have such a big cloud here? Um, although we do quite um, accurate measurements of these angles, we see that um, that that the CL covers quite a range, and we try to explain that. And one one option could be dynamic stall that that is now also investigated in Spain, but there might be other reasons, and this is what we try to get after. And this is the drag, and we have also done some wind tunnel experiments. I think I need to speed up here. Um, this is like a ram air wing section that we tried to simulate in open foam with mem for pi as a structural solver. You don't see the structural mesh here, um, only the, the pressure distribution. And finally, let's say leaving the domain of soft wings, we also look at um, rigid wings, and this was work that was done together with Makani, to uh, one master student who went there to analyze the uh, wing um, torsion and bending, also fluttering of the large M600 wing um, with um, with AS wing. It was a super interesting result that uh, that made it into a very nice paper but I cannot go into the details here. And then if we again leave the realm of single systems and go one dimension higher to the wind part, the question is, or kite part in this sense, the question is how is the production uh, characteristic of such a kite part, for example, also when the wind direction changes, how do we need to space these systems um, because to avoid um, um, let's say mechanical collision of kites, entanglements of tethers, and as well also aerodynamic interaction by wakes. We are mostly focusing now on the first two, mechanical collision, so this is uh, challenging enough. Um, but what I, so let's say several works have already been done in that sector. What I want to highlight is the electrical output profile when you go from one system where you have plus minus production over the pumping cycles to multiple systems which you operate in with phase shifts. You can actually uh, lift the entire, uh, let's say, power 
profile of this part into the positive. Here we have eight by eight kites, and I think these are small kites that generate already above a, hum, uh, um, a one megawatt. Hmm? Safety and reliability, I need to be quick. Um, maybe this is a very nice spectacular plot um, from 2012. So not always everything goes right. In this, sen in this case, actually the, the, safety, um, the safety link snapped as part of the, tether, uh, the kite launch maneuver. I showed you in the beginning an upside down launch from the mast which was successful. This is the version that was not successful where and you see from this debris here that it's the, um, we, had, um, we had rip shock absorbers integrated and that deployed, but still I think the tether snap and then we needed to pull the kite down on the fifth line that we always use an additional safety mechanism um, this is an early test and of course nowadays this is uh, not happening anymore because we worked for a decade on getting this better and better. And I think with this last slide here I can come to the end. This is just a nice visualization of what a uh, master's student, now PhD researcher Dylan Eichelhoff had done um, within his master's thesis collaborative project between ETH Zurich, TU Delft, and DTU designing a, a multi-megawatt kite based on the AMPIC system with the idea to develop it into a standard system that is open, that can be used by everyone. And we provide also a code framework that allows you simulating this system simply to have um, a comparison based so Dylan is now doing his PhD and developed that system further. International activity is only one slide, and then we have the end. Um, so we have the Airborne Wind Energy Conferences, the AWAC, and I think we are now getting to the ninth conference in Milan next year in June. So if you're interested, please make sure to submit a, an, an abstract, one page. Um, until 7th of January. Um, we have also Airborne Wind Europe. Airborne Wind Europe is our industry association within Europe. Um, within Airborne Wind Europe, we have working groups on the different aspects of airborne wind energy that are deemed important for industrialization. So that is safety and reliability. We have also, we are also looking at standardization and also at other aspects. We have also developed the glossary and that could be of importance, glossary of airborne wind energy terminology that you can look up on their website. Uh, so we defined what, what is what and how things should be called because we have seen in the literature that the, that the language is deviating quite a lot and that introduces a lack of, or let's say a moment of uncertainty and imprecision. Uh, what do we exactly compare? So this glossary is like a first attempt to introduce a language standard for airborne wind, for, for airborne wind energy. So please have a look. Then we have the European Academy for Wind Energy Technical Committee Airborne Wind Energy. I'm chairing this to together with several other people, uh, other key academics within Europe. And last but not least, we launch the IEA Wind Task 48 on airborne wind energy. IEA is the International Energy Agency. And with this task, we have gained quite a lot of recognition, um, uh, which is good. And this framework, which will last for five years, will allow us to synchronize and uh, all the international activities and collaborate. It doesn't provide funding, but it provides a very energetic uh, collaborator, a coordinator, or we call it operator, Airborne Wind Europe, um, linking all these uh, groups together. 
So if you're interested in that task, uh, you can contact me. We also have there several working groups. With this, I want to stop. I think we just needed one hour. And if you have questions, I'm open for that. Thank you.